Well, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys about um, some work that I've been doing looking at uh, various ways of, of, of capitalizing on the comparisons between children with uh, specific language impairment and children with ADHD. Uh, I'm going to first start with the acknowledgments <clears throat> and recognize the support that I've been getting from NIDCD um, and um, uh, the support from consultants and uh, my project manager, Andrea Ash, as well as uh, the community contacts and uh, a team of research assistants that have over the years helped me uh, work out what I've collected. And of course, um, at the moment, I have no relevant relationships to disclose. That always sounds sad when I say it. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't figured out any way to make money off of this stuff yet. OK. So um, when, I, when I was coming up for a title for the, for the talk, um, I thought I was quite clever with this because uh, the, the notion of an ADHD context it can actually be placed out in multiple ways. And so um, what, we're, what I'm going to uh, talk ourselves through here is uh, the issue of the ADHD context as a, a co-occurring um, condition that's, that does uh, occur with language impairments um, more frequently than uh, we might expect it to. Uh, but then that leads into the question, um, how to interpret these co-occurrence rates uh, in the context of the possibility that we might have measurement error uh, working its way through how we um, identify the co-occurrence rate. Uh, and then uh, the next question will be, what happens when a child has both an ADHD and a language impairment? And that gives us, moves us into the realm of different models of comorbidity uh, and whether or not ADHD plus language impairment represents a subtype of language impairments, or is it the case that um, the combination of ADHD plus language impairment would make your language impairment worse or your symptoms with ADHD um, more severe? Um, and then uh, one thing that started to play out here was this idea that uh, the, the group of children with ADHD might represent a better control group than the traditional comparisons that we have between children with SLI and typically developing peers, and I'll, I'll talk ourselves through why I think that's the case. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about the possibility that ADHD uh, might be the best thing that could happen to a child with a language impairment because that could increase the likelihood that they'll receive services. Okay, so um, the first topic is taking a quick survey of what's available on the issue of whether or not ADHD and language impairments uh, co-occur. Um, but first we have to kind of lay out on the table what we're talking about with ADHD and SLI. And um, I've been um, playing around with different ways to set this up, but it, it helps to think about um, ADHD and SLI in the larger context. Uh, so one way of talking about this would be to point out something that's quite obvious, that everyone knows what ADHD is, uh, everyone has had their personal lives affected uh, by someone with ADHD, um, much more so than the, the idea that, uh, that SLI is affecting um, uh, multiple people. And uh, so we can characterize ADHD as, as, as a very um, uh, well-established uh, clinical brand, uh, whereas SLI is sort of um, marginalized in these discussions. Um, I've offered sort of the, the uh, standard definitions of both. Um, in both of them, there's this notion that there's an unexpected difficulty relative to other areas. Uh, these are two conditions that seem to be uh, uh, comparably matched in terms of prevalence rates from epidemiological reports. Uh, in both areas, they represent the most common version or common type uh, of the larger class of disorders that they belong to. Uh, so one thing that's very um, uh, interesting about SLI relative to ADHD is that ADHD is a condition that is monitored by the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we get uh, information on disconnects between the prevalence rate based on epidemiological reports uh, relative to how many kids are actually being diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and there is a discrepancy, so uh, much more kids are being diagnosed with ADHD uh, than the epidemiological reports would suggest. Uh, but we are completely flying blind when it comes to SLI. Uh, it is not tracked by any entity. 
uh, the Centers for Disease Control, the U.S. Department of Education, or ASHA. Um, but based on epidemiological and longitudinal reports, uh, it's pretty clear that, these, uh, that SLI is being wildly underdiagnosed. Uh, there is a male to female ratio well established in ADHD uh, uh, slanted towards, uh, towards males and in, in reports of SLI uh, we're finding out that things are much more balanced. Um, both conditions have um, a variety of, of different tools available to clinicians uh, with standardized and um, uh, non-standardized procedures. Um, ADHD is recognized as a highly comorbid condition, a co-occurring with, with just about everything else. Uh, and what we, can, what we know about specific language impairment is, is that it does frequently co with reading disability, but there's uh, some mixed signals about other areas that seem, might, may or may not be compromised. Um, in both areas, heterogeneity has encouraged uh, different uh, subtyping initiatives and in both cases, the subtyping initiatives haven't shown developmental stability, um, but they seem to be uh, clinically useful to think about uh, ADHD uh, without hyperactivity, uh, ADHD without attention problems, uh, and then the uh, combined profile. And similarly in SLI, we talk about uh, expressive and receptive deficits. Um, in, in the ADHD world, it's interesting because there's, there's a, a long-standing interest in establishing markers for differential diagnosis. Um, and uh, we'll take a look at some of the things that have been done there. Uh, in contrast, it seems like the, the SLI world is working in a different direction. So we start off with a constrained definition of who could fit the profile of SLI, and then we try to uh, sp spread it out into areas outside of language. Um, and then uh, finally, it's clear that ADHD is a well-resourced disability uh, with lots of uh, financial um, and research dollars, a very large critical mass of investigators working on it, and um, the SLI world is wildly under-resourced relative to the prevalence rate of the condition. Okay, so if, if you were to try and synthesize what's available out there on ADHD and language impairments in terms of comorbidity, uh, you can muster uh, citations to support the claim that these things are uh, frequently co-occurring. Uh, but you can also identify um, a, uh, studies where the, the, there is much less of a, of a prevalence rate of co-occurrence between the two conditions. Uh, and that in some studies, the co-occurrence rate gets very close to the population estimates. Okay, so I'm gonna lay out um, a, f a figure here in which we're going to take a look at uh, uh, prevalence rates and co-occurrence rates um, from 0% to 100%. And so to place things into, into reference, we'll start off with what's the official prevalence rate of ADHD based on uh, the APA and uh, meta-analyses of epidemiological reports. Uh, and then we'll contrast that with the diagnostic rate for, for both sexes that came out um, in 2013. Uh, and then we can disaggregate that value and identify that uh, 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 the Centers for Disease Control uh, reports that 15% of males um, in the school age population have been diagnosed uh, with ADHD. Uh, and there's, we also know, uh, again, uh, by virtue of the data collected by the Centers for Disease Control, uh, that their diagnostic rate of, of ADHD actually varies quite considerably across different areas. Uh, so it's uh, the western states, including Utah, have some of the lowest rates in the country, and the southern and eastern rates um, have much higher uh, reported values. Okay, so then we bring in uh, language impairment and or specific language impairment uh, from uh, the, the Ottawa and the Iowa uh, epidemiological reports. And one thing that you can note right away is that there's, there's a discrepancy in the recency of the information that's available to us in these two disorders. Uh, so we're, we have um, a 15-year-old data that we're all using to uh, provide s uh, support for how prevalent uh, uh, specific language impairment is. 
Okay, and as I mentioned before, um, nobody seems to be tracking this in any systematic way. And if you take a look at the caseloads or, or uh, surveys that ASHA has collected over the years, ASHA has actually done a better job of tracking how many kids with ADHD are receiving services from speech language pathologists. Um, but we don't have any ability to identify kids who have primary language impairment or specific language impairment and uh, how prevalent or how prominent they are in, in speech pathologist caseloads. Okay. And then what I've done here is I've tried to identify sort of the, the, um, the highest and the lowest values that are, are out there in terms of ADHD plus language impairment co-occurrence. Okay, so that almost covers the entire range um, with values around 3% to uh, over 90%. Okay, and before I, I push the button and bring up the next slide, uh, it, I want you to think about where, where might we see uh, the distribution of other reports would it, should it lean up, lean up more towards the high end or the low end, uh, so that there should be some kind of pattern that comes out uh, when we take a, a broader sample of reports. Okay, so what happens when you do that is you find a value, you find a report that almost lands on every possible value that you could think of. Uh, so we've got reports that uh, suggest these things are happening. Uh, a, a more or less a 50% rate, and other reports that suggest that it's more, uh, much lower than that, and other reports that suggest it's much higher than that. So basically this is a very generous uh, body of research that can support any theory you want um, about uh, the nature of uh, language impairment and ADHD links. Okay, so uh, there's some there's some contributors maybe to these cross signals that are variable in the literature. Uh, one is uh, the the well attested phenomenon of the Berkson's bias. So this idea that uh, children who are receiving clinical services are going to have more severe symptoms and are likely to have multiple uh, conditions, and that you get a distorted view unless you step out and look at things from an epidemiological perspective. But as you can see, there's quite a bit of overlap between those arranges as well. It, it does seem to matter whether or not you're asking the question how many kids with language impairments uh, seem to have uh, symptoms that are consistent with ADHD versus how many kids with ADHD seem to have symptoms of language impairment. Um, but again, there's still quite a bit of overlap. Um, we could also take a look at whether older reports where our, where our diagnostic schemes were, were still in development versus are more um, sensitive, hopefully, and more um, uh, psychometrically intact or, or developed uh, protocols. Uh, again, there's still quite a bit of overlap. And it also seems to matter somewhat whether or not you're controlling for nonverbal IQ when you're talking about language impairment and ADHD, um, where we get lower values in those studies that consider the impact of, of not low nonverbal IQ on both language and ADHD. Uh, but there's another issue here, and that is these, these co-occurrence rates estimates are meaningless if we can't trust the tools that we're using to identify language impairments as being capable of identifying a language impairment and not um, misidentifying ADHD and vice versa. And in both clinical arenas, we've got a, a wide a variety of choices, and in both areas, uh, we certainly have measures that are capable of differentiating a typical status from atypical status, but that's, that's a different question from identifying different kinds of atypical status. Um, and so some of our measures are really good at identifying kids who are not per, uh, functioning in the normal range, uh, but are, end up being very poor when we're trying to use them for differential uh, identification. Okay, so that leads me into the next point here, which is, um, uh, out of all the choices that we have in front of us for identifying uh, ADHD uh, symptoms in children with language impairments, which ones might be a better choice over others? And then conversely, which language measures might be better choices for measuring language abilities in kids with ADHD? Uh, part of this uh, background in, in thinking about uh, how to uh, identify behavioral markers for differential diagnosis is that both uh, language impairment, specific language impairment, and ADHD have uh, undergone um, conceptual revisions over the years. 
And one, one revision that, that um, um, influences this uh, discussion about language impairment ADHD is that it, the, the, the notion of ADHD has evolved across the different DSM uh, schemes. And so in DSM-3, uh, we had something called situational ADHD, where uh, you could have ADHD if your symptoms existed in either the academic or non-academic context. So you could have ADHD that functions from 8 to 3, uh, Monday to Friday, uh, uh, September to June, right? Um, in DSM-4, uh, that was identified as a problem, and then the, the criteria was was moved that at least some of the ADHD symptoms needed to exist in multiple settings. And for, for children, that means school and home settings. And then the DSM-5, there's a much more deliberate attempt to identify, um, actually move away from a situational ADHD kind of concept and notice that children with specific learning disorders uh, may appear to have ADHD but really don't. And so if the limitations for children with specific learning disorders uh, do not impair outside of um, um, academic context, then you cannot have ADHD, um, is how it's uh, currently formulated. Okay. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for uh, coming up with a behavioral measure, a, a situation where children do something uh, that would allow us to identify performance that would place them at risk for ADHD. And um, in this context, the, these measures called executive function tasks have been developed. Uh, but I'm going to suggest um, here that the, these executive function tasks actually represent very poor choices um, um, for taking up this issue of identifying overlap between ADHD and language impairments. Uh, one, of the, one of the main reasons for this is that um, it's recognized that the executive function tasks, uh, tests and measures uh, haven't, haven't lived up to their uh, potential yet in terms of being able to consistently identify children with ADHD. And so roughly about half the children with in an ADHD sample will, will perform within the clinical range on any given executive function task, leaving the other half to, to perform within normal limits. Um, and so this obviously compromises our ability to, to use them as the stand-in measure for uh, ADHD. Um, this doesn't stop people from, from developing various homegrown versions of executive function tasks. Uh, you just pick up a copy of E-Prime and go to town on it. Um, and that's a problem for bringing up um, these clinical symptoms is because we, those, those particular procedures have unknown levels of reliability and validity. Um, for those standardized executive function tasks that are available, uh, their test retest reliabilities are not um, adequate. And in the particular context of identifying um, language impairments, uh, an older report by Riley, who's um, uh, one of the authors for um, these executive function tasks, they reported an 81% positive false rate um, when using um, executive function tasks relative to uh, parent and teacher rated symptoms of ADHD. So children who had ADHD and a language impairment versus kids who just had a language impairment. Um, the kids with language impairments were coming up positive on the ADHD measures, uh, the executive function measures. Okay, and then there's another, there's another uh, a body or, or type or class of behavioral measure of, of attention referred to as uh, continuous performance tasks. And um, continuous performance tasks have the interesting possibility of being very good at differentiating typical status from atypical status. But it, it, as, a, as I've mentioned here in this slide, uh, it's, it seems to be the case that virtually any disorder of childhood will display uh, uh, weaknesses in continuous performance measures. And so um, uh, this, is a, this is a direct quote, a list from uh, uh, this book and uh, notice the variety of conditions, mental retardation, seizure disorders, maltreatment, and then there was a study that used general medical referrals. So basically kids that were in the waiting rooms of the pediatricians were given um, a continuous performance assessment and they all came up scoring within the clinical range. Uh, and it is true that children with specific language impairment have also 
shown weaknesses on these measures. In fact, it would be really weird if they didn't uh, relative to the variety of conditions uh, that these tools are able to uh, pick up on. Uh, and so it would be, as uh, stated by the authors of um, uh, this volume, that to rely on these performance measures as the primary diagnostic tool would yield uh, unacceptably high measures of false positive rates. Um, a lot of these continuous performance measures use numbers and letters as their stimuli, and you could consider that to be problematic for kids with language and or reading problems. Uh, there is a continuous performance t uh, measure that does not use numbers or letters, the tests of variables of attention, uh, but uh, its specificity rate is uh, 22%. So I'm, I'm not going to um, <laughs> suggest we go. I'm not going to. I'm going to suggest we not go there. Okay. Um, and instead, um, the the gold standard in this area um, uh, seems to be, in terms of um, clinical practice, uh, the use of uh, standardized rating scales, uh, and they're often collected from parents and teachers. Uh, I'm going to suggest, in the context of looking for. Uh, ADHD symptoms in children with language impairments that we move towards uh, preferring parent ratings over teacher ratings. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is that when parent ratings are positive for ADHD status, 90% of the time they agree with the teacher assignment of ADHD status. And people have argued that that means that suggests that they are sufficient uh, for the diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, but Overall, if you were to look at the levels of agreement between parent and teacher ADHD ratings, uh, these have been um, uh, consistently modest in the literature, less than 0.5 levels of, of um, uh, concordance. Um, uh, and teacher ratings also have been shown to, to not be concordant with observational measures of ADHD symptoms. Um, and uh, in some of the work that I did a uh, long, long time ago, uh, <laughs> looking at teacher ratings of children with specific language impairment from kindergarten to first grade to second grade um, with Mabel Rice, uh, what we found was that uh, the teachers across different grades wouldn't, uh, couldn't agree on which kids were um, um, presenting with ADHD symptoms in the clinical range. So a child with SLI might uh, be characterized or considered by, the, by their teachers having a lot of problems in the areas of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, uh, but, the next, but when the child moves into the next grade, they're suddenly performing with the normal limits. Um, uh, so that's a, a potential problem. Um, it's also the case that heritability estimates that are based on parent ratings are higher than those based on teachers, and that the teacher ratings and the, 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 the variance that's captured by the teacher ratings overlaps with the variance that's captured by parental ratings. So parental ratings are like a subset of um, uh, uh, these, these attempts to move towards genetic measurements of, or genetic um, um, factors in play for ADHD. And then there's also direct evidence that if you give, if you give teachers uh, standardized rating scales to identify ADHD symptoms in children with uh, language impairments, uh, that they will um, uh, basically display bias against children with, with language impairments. Uh, so in a study that uh, was done by Chiracha et al, where they looked at kids with language impairments, children with reading dif uh, disabilities, and children with intellectual disabilities, it was the group of kids with language impairments where the, the concordance between the teacher ratings and a blinded psychiatric interview um, was, the, was the, um, the most discordant. So there's twice as, there were twice as many false positives as true positives in the group of kids with language impairments. And that didn't happen in the other clinical groups. OK, so uh, I'm going to suggest that parent ratings are going to give us the clearest signal on what's going on with kids with uh, language impairments in the areas that are tapped into by uh, the, idea, the, the disorder ADHD. Um, but I don't think we're ready yet. One thing we also have to do is take a look at the scales themselves for the content and see if there's the possibility that there might be uh, confounds there. And so um, uh, one thing I did uh, a while ago was took a, a look at some of the more commonly used uh, pediatric psychiatric scales and identified that, men, or noticed that many of them 
included language and academic items. So I don't think it's a stretch to suggest that if you include items like won't talk, has speech problems, or poor schoolwork, uh, that you're also going to be tapping into uh, the dimensions of language impairment. Um, and in, in the world of ADHD, it's not uncommon to take standardized rating scales when you're doing them for, when the, when the purpose is for differential diagnosis and make adjustments based on overlapping symptoms. Uh, and so what we did um, um, was uh, we took the, the child behavior checklist and the Connors um, um, scales, which represent the two most commonly used uh, pediatric psychiatric instruments. And we removed the language and academic items that these items contain. And, and uh, that's the list right there on, on the, um, in, the, in parentheses there. So that we took out won't talk, speech problems, doesn't seem to understand what's being said to him, et cetera. And what we did was we took those items out of the scales. And um, so one thing that could happen when you do that is you basically compromise the diagnostic integrity of the tool to differentiate um, ADHD from typical status. But we, we, didn't, we didn't find that at all. What happens when you do this is it actually increases their capability to differentiate language impairment from ADHD. Uh, and it didn't compromise the ability to differentiate kids with ADHD from their typically developing peers. Um, our ROC curves with the um, adjusted scales were in the, uh, in the um, low to high 90 range, which is quite good. Um, and one thing that you, when you start to collect um, a behavioral rating scales on, on different clinical groups is that you start to realize that um, uh, it's a matter of scale, so that if you see a difference between kids with, which has been reported in the literature between children with specific language impairment, typically developing kids, uh, and there's group, significant group differences, the question is, is whether or not that's, that, that level of difference is the same as you would see in, in a group of kids with a, with a psychiatric condition. And it's, it's clearly very different. Uh, the, the symptoms that you would see in kids with ADHD are much, much more severe relative to typically developing uh, controls than you would see when you compare kids with SLI and, and kids with um, typical development. Okay, um, so now uh, I've suggested that what we want to do is take a look at parent rating scales when we're looking at the co-occurrence rate between uh, ADHD and language impairment. And then I'm going to move now towards taking a, a consideration of our own um, uh, available possible language measures for looking at language abilities in kids with ADHD. And I'm, what I'm going to suggest off the bat is that we avoid vocabulary, uh, things that are called verbal IQ, and uh, the pragmatic indices that are available to us uh, because these things have um, uh, problems in, in addressing this question. And so, in a, in a, in a, in a very um, helpful review by Spalding, Plant, and Farinella, they went through um, uh, the, the what at the time, the basic um, uh, choices we have in terms of standardized tests for language assessments. And what they noticed was that the consistently the items that are measuring vocabulary have the weakest levels of, of um, sensitivity and specificity. Um, and uh, so that's why we shouldn't do vocabulary. But uh, pragmatics uh, seems to be an area that would be a natural fit for ADHD. Uh, and one reason for that is you can, you can basically redefine ADHD symptoms into uh, a pragmatic uh, deficit. And so that was done uh, by Camarada, Hughes, and, and Rule. Um, and there's also, um, you can even go further than that. You can take the DSM manual and redefine every psychiatric condition as a pragmatic impairment. Uh, and that was actually done in a book called Language and Psychiatry, where uh, there's, there's, a, there's a section for each area in the DSM. Uh, so borderline personality disorder, ADHD, psychotic disorders, uh, schizophrenia, uh, would all potentially, if you have a very open view of what pragmatics is, uh, anything that creates interpersonal distress could be defined as a pragmatic deficit. And that's not a good thing when you're trying to find out um, um, how often things co-occur. Um, 
in some of the work that we, uh, data that we've collected, uh, we've we've played around with um, taking a look at how pragmatic measures uh, load or don't load into different areas. Uh, Bruce Tomlin did a similar analysis on his um, in his his a book length treatment of the Iowa epidemiological sample. And when you do that, what you find out is that pragmatic measures do not load onto a common factor with other language measures, uh, which by itself isn't a bad thing because we think of pragmatics as being potentially a separate domain from semantics, syntax, phonology, morphology. Uh, but what it does load with is other psychiatric scales. So, so uh, the children's uh, communication checklist, the pragmatic problems subscale, uh, it loads with anxiety, ADHD, um, and other um, uh, syndrome scales that, are, uh, that you can measure with the child behavior checklist or the Connors. Uh, it's also the case that when interventions have been directed at improving pragmatic and social cognitive skills, uh, they don't seem to have an impact on semantic and syntactic skills, su su suggesting that these are separate domains. Um, so we should probably not um, go there for measuring language impairment. Um, and instead, I'm going to suggest that the, those emerging um, markers of specific language impairment, nonverbal repetition, um, sentence recall, and grammatical uh, uh, tense marking indices represent good choices, uh, uh, in part because they're being used in genetic work to look at the underlying mechanisms um, uh, for language impairment. Uh, it's also the case that these measures have been really good um, for differentiating typical status from atypical status. And so the, the next question is how good are they at differentiating between different clinical conditions? Okay, uh, and so this was, this was actually the, 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 the article that I placed on reserve for the uh, talk today. Um, so you all should have access to this and I'm going to just uh, lay it out here on what happened. So I'm presenting box plots so you can see the distributions within these groups. Uh, you can also, when I do this, you can also take a look to see if there's like a hidden subgroup within the ADHD sample. Uh, so these are, these are clinical samples. So these are children receiving services uh, for language impairment, children receiving services for ADHD, and, and a, a, a sample of typically developing controls. And so this is what happens when you, when you take a look at tense marking. Uh, there is no difference between the, the group of kids with ADHD and the typically developing controls. Uh, they're basically functioning at, at ceiling levels of performance. Uh, these are seven to eight year olds uh, that we're looking at here. And I uh, notice that within the SLI group, there's huge variability. Uh, it, it basically covers the range of possible scores with the subgroup of kids who are performing the poorest um, with language impairments um, in the SLI group. Uh, this is what happens when you take a look at nonverbal repetition. Um, there's a little guy there in the typically developing group that's not like the others, um, breaking out and um, uh, um, lining up more with the distribution for kids with language impairments. Uh, this is sentence recall. Now we've got a kid in the SLI group that's breaking away. Good for him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, lining up exactly with the normal range. Uh, but it does look like sentence recall is a measure perhaps of, of um, uh, verbal short-term memory or uh, grammatical processing uh, is a good indicator of, of language impairment status. And the, in this particular study, we also had narratives. And um, uh, there's, a, there's more overlap between the groups and narratives, uh, but it is clearly differentiating. And I included narratives in that study because I thought that if there was an area of language where kids with ADHD would potentially show weaknesses, it would be narratives uh, because of the planning and organizational demands that are involved there. Uh, it would make perfect sense to expect kids with ADHD to show weaknesses. Uh, and uh, uh, they didn't. Okay, and then um, after that report came out, uh, there was a nice replication of that study in a Dutch sample of children. Um, in Perager's report, uh, she also included measures of executive functioning and asked the question whether or not executive functioning would line up or, or predict some of the uh, 
uh, weaknesses and um, language abilities. And what they found basically replicated what we found, that non-word repetition, sentence recall, tense marking, and narratives um, were not associated with, with um, ADHD status. Um, and that there was no significant correlation between those measures and executive function. And um, there was a prediction that had been out there that uh, the language profiles, the, the language impairments in children with ADHD um, uh, might be linked to their executive function problems. And in particular, we would see a link between executive function problems and pragmatic difficulties. And that was, that was also not found in this Dutch sample of kids. Um, it's possible that there might be um, com uh, communication markers for ADHD uh, that are unique to ADHD. Uh, one area that, that um, hasn't been explored in, the, in uh, the specific language impairment research, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we typically talk about uh, vocal problems as a big primary symptom of children with SLI, but that, that does seem to be something that's associated with ADHD. And it's, uh, the, the idea being that it's linked to their, um, uh, their hyperfunction in general, including vocal hyperfunction. And so these kids have um, poor voice qualities relative to typically developing controls. And I've also seen some differences in, in conversational samples between kids with ADHD and SLI and the number of utterance formulation problems. Uh, and so in the world of SALT, where you put everything in parentheses and it turns into a maze, uh, when you do that, it looks like kids with ADHD are doing a lot more mazing, false starts, ums and ohs, and, and, and repairs relative to kids with SLI. Okay. Um, so we're going to, uh, this next slice is going to be taking a look at what happens when you use uh, parent ratings and those uh, clinical markers of SLI and you ask a different question. You ask, in those kids who have ADHD and language impairment, uh, is it the case that their symptoms in either area are worse relative to the kids who present with more, a more pure uh, clinical profile? And comorbidity is an interesting topic in and of itself. Um, and when you, when you think of all the different ways two disorders might interact with each other, it becomes um, quite intricate. And so you might have a situation where, as I mentioned, there might be additive or interactive, interactive effects where, where the uh, symptoms are worse in the com comorbid group relative to the um, non-comorbid or, or pure group. And we have, we have addressed this issue in, this, in the literature on kids with specific language impairment or language impairments in other areas. And so uh, people have looked at what happens when you have a language impairment and weak nonverbal abilities uh, these kids are referred to in the literature these days as non-specific language impairment, but in earlier eras, we would have referred to those kids as having borderline intellectual uh, disability. Um, it's been shown that children with the, the non-specific language impairment perform worse than the children with SLI across various language metrics, and that their growth has uh, actually been shown to be slower. And it's also the case that children who have additional non-verbal limitations uh, are at greater risk for academic uh, and, and, in particular, behavior problems. Uh, another comorbidity that's been given a lot of treatment in our, in our literature has been the comorbidity between language impairment and reading disability. And in studies that have looked at the language abilities of kids who also have um, uh, reading disability, uh, there is no um, difference in terms of severity or profiles for kids who have language impairment with or without a reading disability. And so those are two possible scenarios that could happen uh, when we take a look at what's going on with ADHD and language impairment. Uh, there's, a, there's a third possibility, and that is uh, you can have subtractive effects uh, when you have co-occurring disorders. And that can happen if you have a, a protective mechanism that's associated with one disorder that's brought in um, by virtue of being uh, co-occurring with another disorder. Uh, to offset the risks that they're associated with the uh, other disorder. Okay, I'm, you can't read that. Okay, so I'll tell you what's up on the slide. Uh, can you guys read that? Can you see that? Okay, okay. Um, so what I have here is um, 
So I, I, have, I have two, two samples that I've been um, looking at in the research projects. And so one, as I mentioned, is a clinical sample where I went out and identified kids by virtue of receiving services. And then we also have uh, access to a community sample that's, that's being collected over time uh, by virtue of the fact that we're going out into the schools in Salt Lake City and screening kids um, uh, for, uh, for language impairments and then bringing those kids in to the lab who fail the screening and identifying those who have language impairments. Um, what happens when you do that is you identify kids who have language impairments that are not receiving services. And if we interpret what's going on with those epidemiological reports, that's actually the more common profile for specific language impairment. Then it's more likely for children not to be receiving services than to be receiving services. Um, so we have some of those kids in, this, in the sample as well. Um, so what I have laid out here uh, is was actually just um, uh, accepted for LSHSS, is we have 19 kids with SLI, 19 kids who have ADHD plus language impairment in a control group. And I have, I have non-word repetition, sentence recall, and then the different probes from the TEGI for um, test of early grammatical impairment for measuring uh, different aspects of um, command of the tense feature. And um, if you go over to the column on contrast, what you see is that um, uh, the, the ADHD plus language impaired group is not significantly different from the kids with specific language impairment. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be the case that there's an additive or an interactive effect on language abilities when a child also has um, a clinically identified ADHD. And in fact, uh, if you go into the details here, um, in each case, uh, the kids with ADHD plus language impairment are doing better. Uh, than the children with specific language impairment. So not only is it not showing up as an additive or interactive effect, it's providing what seems to be a modest subtractive effect. Okay, so here is um, some box plots. And again, I'm, I'm doing this deliberately to, to put out on the, on, for, your, for your inspection whether or not there's a, a potential subgroup of kids with ADHD plus language impairment that are um, breaking out of these uh, box plots and coming up as outliers. Uh, the outliers are in the SLI group. Um, that was non-word repetition. Uh, this is sentence recall. Again, there's a little guy there uh, in, the, in the normal, in the typically developing control group that's having difficulties. Um, and then here is the TEGI screening score, which is a composite of uh, the present tense and past tense measures. So the lowest performers in this sample are the kids in the SLI group. Uh, we looked at correlations across these different scales, and we found a positive correlation between um, uh, DS, DSM, H, DSM ADHD symptoms as measured by the child behavior checklist and uh, sentence recall and third person present. Now, uh, what that means is because the DSM scales are, are oriented so that higher scores mean more severe symptoms, and lower scores mean more normal performance. If we have a positive correlation between uh, language and um, ADHD symptoms, that means that kids with the more severe ADHD symptoms are showing relatively better language abilities than the kids with uh, less severe ADHD symptoms. And this is based on a combined sample of the SLI and the ADHD LI groups. Okay, and then, um, I can update some, some work that's going on looking at narratives. Um, so these are, again, the, um, this time we have, the, we, have the, we have the ADHD group added in as a, another comparison. And um, what's going on here is, again, that the, um, uh, the ADHD and the SLI groups are very similar. Um, and what, notice what happens here, though, is that the ADHD group ends up being a better control so if the group mean for the ADHD group is 100. Uh, the group mean for the typically developing group is around 110. Uh, and that's actually a very common aspect of our literature. We, we've 
we have consistently compared kids with specific language impairment to, to not a typically developing group, but an advantaged group, right? So it's not uncommon for our control samples to have IQs that are higher than the standardized, uh, the means based on the standardized tests. Um, and uh, that's happening here in the narratives where the kids with ADHD are actually more normal uh, than the kids with, um, uh, in the typically developing group. If we, if we step out a little bit and, and take a look, these are z-scores um, at the relative severity of symptoms across these different language areas. Um, it looks like uh, um, we, have the, we have the biggest differentiation going on um, um, with tense marking in both the SLI group and the ADHD post language impaired group. Um, and that actually as you move into narratives, uh, the symptoms become um, less severe, which is kind of interesting because you'd expect as you bring in more complexity into the task that that would sort of compound um, uh, the deficit. But what could also be happening is that as the task becomes more complicated, children have more compensatory resources uh, to draw upon for, for accomplishing those tasks. And that it's, it's really when you, when you measure in with a laser-like focus at these areas of weaknesses that you be, are you're able to find the strongest signals for language impairment. Okay, so in summary, what we found here was very clear phenotypic boundaries. If we take a look at um, parent ratings and when we're asking the question of behavior, um, uh, when children have ADHD, that's often associated with a much more pervasive behavioral problem profile than it is with kids with SLI. Uh, the behavioral profiles of kids with SLI tend to uh, demonstrate weaknesses in inattention and weaknesses in peer relations, whereas kids with ADHD tend to have a much more pervasive uh, profile of weaknesses across multiple areas. Um, the presence or absence of ADHD had very little impact on the clinical markers of specific language impairment. Executive function markers are not um, uh, correlating with language impairment symptoms. Uh, and then there might be uh, a differential marker uh, if we take a closer look, perhaps, at voice symptoms in kids with ADHD versus SLI. Okay. Um, in these core language areas, there's no evidence of a double deficit or an ADHD plus language impairment subtype. And in fact, uh, having ADHD might represent a buffer against risk of poor outcomes. Uh, maybe what's going on here, and I don't have any data to speak to this, this is all speculation at this point, but maybe what's going on here is that if a child has ADHD symptoms and language impairment, that's gonna encourage an earlier referral uh, and or more intensive intervention. And that's going to um, uh, create this sort of subgroup of kids with stronger language skills. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned in that, in that slide on narratives, it looked like the kids with ADHD were actually functioning as a better control group than the typically developing kids who by comparison were actually performing at above average levels, um, almost a standard deviation above uh, according to the norming distributions of that scale. Um, and I think that's, uh, that, that opens up an opportunity uh, to start thinking of kids with ADHD um, who, as I just, just have demonstrated, uh, can, can present without language impairments, uh, might represent our preferred co control group going forward when we take a look at the nonverbal abilities of kids with SLI. Uh, and this was actually uh, quite nicely done by a study by um, uh, uh, Janice Cardi and colleagues, where um, they took to task the, the uh, impaired temporal processing and the generalized slow processing accounts uh, and collected the um, information processing measures that would be used to e evaluate those accounts. And what they found was that in the kids with ADHD who did not have any symptoms of language impairment, uh, they were actually performing poorer on these information processing measures than the kids with SLI who are supposed to have their problems with SLI because of their poor performance on these particular measures. Uh, and so this is a very nice demonstration of the opportunity to test the necessity and the sufficiency of various non-linguistic accounts for the problems of kids with um, specific language impairment. And 
uh, th this, this area is low hanging fruit. There's all kinds of things that people could do uh, because kids with ADHD have had weaknesses reported in nonverbal IQ, dichotic listening, central auditory processing, implicit learning, procedural learning, working memory, serial reaction time, fine motor skills, and gross motor skills. Right? This sounds familiar because this is also the list that gets invoked when we talked about specific language impairment as the soft signs um, that might be contributing to their difficulties. Uh, and so we can take a look at whether or not any of these have anything to do with, with uh, language symptoms by bringing in comparison groups of kids uh, with ADHD. So as I've mentioned, uh, we really can't test uh, sufficiency or necessity when we restrict our uh, consideration to comparing kids with SLI to just their typically developing peers. It's only through these cross etiology comparisons that we can start to tease out whether or not something is um, uh, representing a causal factor. There's, a, there's lots of other reasons why it's better to compare between clinical groups than to compare a clinical group to a typically developing group. And that is this low average presentation that, that's, that sometimes uh, gets introduced in the discussion of SLI as a problem for SLI is a problem for every clinical group there is. Uh, it's true for kids who, are, who have stuttering. It's true for kids um, um, with various um, uh, psychiatric problems. Um, it's just a general um, observation of, of relatively low performance. It's also the case that if you match, if you compare kids with SLI to kids with ADHD, you're going to get more similar demographic profiles. Uh, so um, you're going to get more similar levels um, of comparison with regards to mother educational level, uh, single parent households, and parental stress. Uh, because both groups are dealing with the fallout of having a child with a disability. Um, the children themselves have similar experiences of academic failure, stigmatization, peer rejection, um, all the good and bad things that come with receiving clinical services. And I think there's a very clear difference between when you use uh, typically developing controls, uh, they're often agreeing to participate in your study because they're curious, or maybe they have uh, a sense of uh, civil responsibility, uh, as opposed to a family that's, that comes to your study because they, they desperately want more information about their child's uh, strengths and weaknesses and uh, the families are uh, often in crisis um, because of that. And I think we need to really be cautious about getting too excited about non-linguistic theories of, of SLI until we've, we've taken that step of testing them against um, um, this group of kids who have uh, lots of overlap in non-linguistic areas to kids with specific language impairment. Okay, and then finally, um, uh, that, that thing that I mentioned at the beginning, that maybe having ADHD is the best thing that could happen to a child with a language impairment. Um, I'll unpack that here right now, okay. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, and this is something that for some reason people are just waking up to, that the majority of cases of specific language impairment never receive services. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, it looks like if you're a girl with specific language impairment, um, you're out of luck. Um, boys are much more likely to receive services, even with the same diagnosis and even with the same level of language impairment. Uh, there's also a very clear overrepresentation of males in referral for language assessments. Um, and this is unfortunate because it looks like uh, uh, women with positive histories of language impairment are actually at more risk. Uh, for negative outcomes than their male counterparts. And in particular, uh, sexual assault is uh, elevated in uh, uh, women with a history of language impairment. Um, and in a recent community sample of ADHD, uh, where they were taking a look at how many, um, as an epidemiological study, and they were asking how many kids with ADHD also presented with language impairment, uh, they collected this information that about half the kids with, with ADHD who had a language impairment uh, had access speech services, but in the in the in the non ADHD group, only 16% had. So, um, that's um, that's the basis for this idea that if you have ADHD plus language impairment, uh, 
the prognosis looks to be better than if you don't have ADHD. And then I'm going to, I'm going to wrap things up here with um, a quote uh, from one of our participants. And this is a, this is a nine-year-old guy with um, um, a, a, a standard score on the self in the mid-70s. Uh, he's also marking tense about 75% of the time. And um, his nonverbal IQ is 112. And so uh, for that, I think for that reason, um, uh, the, the family is encountering some frustration with getting attention drawn to his language problems. So because of his learning disability with the reading, the language has always been the back burner. You know what I mean? They figure, well, if he would learn to read, or if we could, learn, if we could help him learn to read or learn to help with this and this and this, then the language thing would probably go away to a point. So it seems like it was never that huge to anyone but, else, but us. Uh, and they're always like, it might be his hearing, and we're always like, it's been checked a hundred times. And so it's almost as if specific language impairment does not compute in clinical services. It can't possibly happen. It has to be due to something else. So let's send him out for another hearing, a round of hearing assessments. Um, or let's focus on uh, the primary academic uh, uh, sequela, the secondary effects of the language impairment. Um, and that maybe if we did language issues would, would naturally adjust themselves as a consequence. Okay, well that's, and then there's like miles and miles of references, but that's <laughs> my presentation. So, uh, Dr. Redmond has certainly given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I open up to any of the research symposium uh, travel awardees. Um, please uh, feel free. We are a, a relatively informal group. Please come forward and, and um, ask questions. Hi, I'm Andy Revere. I'm from LSU in Baton Rouge. Dr. Redmond, I have a question about the 2011 article. Okay. Um, whenever you ran the regression for the SLI versus TD kids, mm -hmm. um, it looks like you said the order was based on the positive likelihood ratios. That was yes. okay. Okay. So the Teggy was first, then sentence imitation, then non-word rep, and then the TNL. Um, I was kind of confused because it looks like the not looks like non-word rep had a higher positive likelihood ratio of nine and a half versus sentence imitation at nine. Was that based on new means after you collapsed the ADHD and TD group? Yes, exactly. Okay. So so. It's all coming back to me. Okay, so <laughs> yes, so um, in that in that report, after identifying the the value, every one of those measures that we looked at looked like it was very good at differentiating language impairment from ADHD. Um, but then we wanted to ask the question: Well, um, what would be the most efficient combination? Uh, of metrics if we wanted to take a look at it from sort of almost applying it into clinical practice. So if you only had a few minutes to assess, what would you pull together? And that was sort of what was also driving that analysis, uh, was, was um, uh, taking a look at, at how, how few of those measures you could use. And so mm -hmm. we ended up with the combination of sentence recall and tense marking because it ended up having the same predictive value as the, the as the, all four measures, okay. um, but it was it was using uh, the, the 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 test was specific language impairment versus not having specific language impairment, which was an equal representation of ADHD cases and cases of kids with typical development, um, which is not what usually happens when you t when you look at those uh, measures, but. Uh, what I think is that that's actually more, that's a more valuable way of doing it because that's more likely to be present, that's what clinicians are more likely to be presented with. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time testing kids with typical development, right? We don't, we don't, it's, a, it's this weird, so it's, we're much more uh, brought in when there's questions about what's going on here. We know something's uh, problematic. And so the, so the, so the combining the, uh, Setting it up so there's like a 50-50 chance that it was a kid with ADHD or typical development, I thought was a more stringent test mm -hmm. of um, those particular measures. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Tracy Santani. I'm at the MGH Institute of Health Professions in Boston. Um, I actually have two questions. The first is about the prevalence that you spoke about early in your talk. And you mentioned that there were a range of studies about the comorbidity and the prevalence, and there's a very wide range of what's been shown. But you also mentioned that the prevalence of ADHD varies by geographical region. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to if there's any relationship between where those studies were conducted and the prevalence that they found in the comorbidity. Well, it, it's first. certainly another factor that you'd have to consider, and it 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 does it does make it very difficult to synthesize that information uh, because that's another that's another potential dimension. Um, that's the, that's actually the, the 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 that's the diagnostic rate, not necessarily the prevalence rate, and so those are what's being reported in those states. Um, as opposed to the epidemiological reports where it's a more deliberate community sampling. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the, the one way to interpret that is that um, there might be an over-identification of kids with ADHD, and that, for whatever reason, varies across different states. The other thing that's important uh, is that you, all of these conditions are, are we, we believe, are influenced by genetic and environmental effects. And if that's true, then there should be geographical variability based on, on uh, the kinds of exposures kids have relative to different um, uh, industries uh, and um, uh, the, the, uh, the gene pools in the different areas. And so that's not necessarily a problem for, I mean, it, it would actually be a problem if, if we defined SLI as some kind of cutoff and then, then, we, then we work the, <laughs> The demographics of the community around so that so that five percent of that population was always SLI regardless of, of any reference to a common metric. Um, I don't know if I answered your question though. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> but the, the second question actually is the more recent article that just got accepted. Uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering in your ADHD sample if you controlled it all for medication, because obviously oh, my children goodness. with ADHD that have, yes. they're okay. more severe are more likely to have medication. Okay, so that, that's actually a big omission, I apologize. So um, the convention in the ADHD world is to always test kids on your experimental measure when they're off of medication. And so we ask parents to suspend medication for 24 hours before they come in. Um, what we've been doing is that we, we allow, we, the children come in for um, um, eligibility testing and then experimental testing. And during the eligibility testing, they're on medication, because that's like, that would be a reasonable accommodation kind of argument. Uh, but when they come in for the language testing, they're off of their medication. And it's, it's quite a trip, uh, <laughs> collecting language measures on kids with ADHD, uh, because um, uh, you, have to, you, have to, you have to deliberately choose not to, to enter into a power struggle and let the kids do whatever they want, as long as they're answering the questions. And so we've got videos of kids that are sitting on the floor, um, kids that are pointing with their toes, kids that are, that are tearing things up and making confetti while they're answering questions. Um, these kids get lots of breaks. They, they run a little circuit around the, the corridor. And, and, and um, uh, they also, um, when they complete a task, we let them roll a die. And if the lucky number comes up, they get a prize, which turns out to be a really good way of, of of capitalizing on their risk for gambling addiction uh, <laughs> that's associated with ADHD. Uh, and so, so um, in contrast, if you were to watch a video of a child with SLI who is sitting almost in an ideal fashion with his hands folded uh, and missing every single item on the self and knowing that he's missing every single item on the self um, and does not engage in any of those off-task behaviors that we're seeing with the kids uh, with ADHD. Um, yeah, and I think the trick is to just not get hung up on some kind of like, we need quiet hands and you need to pay attention to me and, and, and that, that sort of stuff that you can get trapped into as a clinician. Because um, um, we don't care, we just want to collect their language and let them go back, right? <laughs> Catch and release, we don't, we don't, we don't have any interest in <laughs> fixing their problem. We just want them to tell us what they can do with language. I'm just wondering if there's any relationship, though, in the kids with ADHD, the length of time they've been on medication prior to you seeing them in the lab, 
sure, even if sure. they're off medication when you test them. Yeah, and, and notice there's like there's a multitude of medications that have different um, uh, delivery systems and different titrations and in. The only way you could get at that is if you were if you were entering into the process where children are just being diagnosed with ADHD before they're put on medication would be the window of opportunity uh, to look at what happens when you're on medication versus off medication, and and there was a there was a report by Rosemary Tannock that suggested that in a small group of kids that were in that situation that their narratives improved when they were on medication, but you're right. I mean there could be residual effect when the kids came in that made their language performance a little better than it should have been, but. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Karen Chanowski at uh, Boston University. And I actually had a, a, a observation, I guess, more uh -huh. than a question about um, your use of the uh, narrative testing to see if you could differentiate the um, ADHD from the SLI group, and right. like you, I found it very interesting that there wasn't that expected difference. But I kind of notice on your table of diagnostic accuracy that it seems like you're getting the best sensitivity and specificity for differentiating SLI and ADHD with the sentence repetition yes. task. And it feels like that might be kind of that optimal balance between the very language specific like grammar formulation things and the sort of short term or working memory kind of considerations that you might think come in with exactly, ADHD. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and the ADHD population is one that has been roughly characterized as being weak with working memory. Right. Some reports suggest that also extends into verbal working memory, but it, it clearly is there in visual working memory. And, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe sentence recall isn't verbal working memory, <laughs> right? I, mean, I, don't, I, don't think we, I don't think we really know what sentence recall is. It's kind of like a hot dog with, um, <laughs> so there's, yummy, some, there's some meat in there, but there's also some fillers and tongues and lips and things. I don't know what <laughs> is actually going on with sentence recall, except that it's really good at identifying kids with language impairments. And maybe we don't yeah. need to know why, it just does. Um, but it, you're right, it, it is interesting that that mm. was, um, uh, coming out as the strongest, and and they were th that in that sample, the kids with ADHD were actually a little bit better than the control group um, when it came to sentence recall. Yeah, so I that was. That. I mean, it could be spurious. It could just be a weird scoop of kids that we did that time. Sure. But it does. It does. Yeah, it, and and that's that's the reason why um, in the follow up project that I have going on, we've used sentence recall as our our mm -hmm. community screening procedure. Mm -hmm. um, it's very quick. Um, it's easy to train undergrads and grads to do it. Um, you can go out and um, invade the schools, <laughs> gym. It, we've been collecting it under real world circumstances, so there's all kinds of uh, distractions that come about when you're doing it in the gym and other people are moving around. And it seems to be working pretty well um, at identifying kids with language impairments. Cool. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eileen Habig. I'm at UW-Madison. And I have a kind of broader question okay. about identifying language impairment in your children with um, ADHD. And then also kind of extends to the SLI and NLI distinction. Well, good. That's distinction. A, the best kind of question. Um, so when we're looking at assessment, sometimes a big concern for, of clinicians is um, the impact of a highly structured testing environment on the scores. Uh -huh. And um, sometimes we notice in our lab that parents come in with concern of their child's language abilities, and this would be the SLI group potentially, and they end up having really high cognitive abilities, but then like, you know, even say 115. And then self scores in the like 90s. Okay. So they have a huge discrepancy in that way, um, but they're not receiving services, they're not identified as language impairment, um, but they show a discrepancy. Do you see differences in your different populations of having a discrepancy in um, any of your populations, or like would a highly structured environment um, boost performance in one, one domain versus another for any of your populations? 
Oh, I, I think that's a that's an empirical question. Right? I mean, you'd have to go out and actually. Or are you noticing trends in your data, or like finding distinctions? I don't or know. I, the I, gaps? I think the more the more you measure, the more I mean, the more things you measure, the more possibilities of discrepancies you produce. Um, and so, um, one of the things that's happened with that community sampling is we also get kids who have good language skills, but have ADHD or autism or behavioral disorders as virtue of the, of the, of the mass screening. Um, and so um, we haven't been able to really look at that deliberately, but it, it does seem to be the case that language sort of flows independently of those other variables. Um, and that's not always appreciated unless you bring in the, the clinical comparison group. Um, but. The, the presence of discrepancies may just be, it may be a common attribute for kids with atypical development. Mm -hmm. We welcome questions from others in the audience. Please come forward if anyone has any. While you're thinking, I have one. Mm. Um, okay. So I, you know, we're always very intrigued with counterintuitive findings, um, and certainly uh, what you're showing with the combination of language impairment and ADHD faring better um, seems quite counterintuitive. Um, and there are certainly many explanations which you've gone through. Uh, one that we kind of tiptoed up to, but I'd like to focus for a second on and ask if anybody is wondering, is whether or not some of the pharmaceutical effects uh, given to kids with ADHD may be uh, useful or suitable, helpful for kids with language impairment without ADHD. And is there any discussion of that? So in, in, the, in, the, in the investigations of the, the impacts of these medications on uh, children with ADHD, the, 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 the concept that it could improve like their academic performance, for example, has been examined and it, and it doesn't. Right, so the, the primary purpose or function of these medications is to get the kids to chill out. Uh, and it's the hyperactivity element that is more affected by the medications than the inattention component, um, which, is, which is the component that you'd expect to be more tightly linked to, to language impairments or reading difficulties. So I buy that theory except for I have experience with kids in college using Ritalin. Um, this was very common, at least when I was at the university. Kids like to use Ritalin to study, and they felt it improved their academic performance. So this is very anecdotal, well, but I think widely we could, we could believed. Show, we could take a show of, hand, show of hands of how many people self-medicated before they came in today's session with, with, uh, Coffee, with a caffe for sure. with caffeine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, and, and um, it's... It, it's it's very it's interesting to move in these circles um, with uh, mental health care professionals. And I had, I had a throwaway line that kind of sunk in after it was tossed out when I was interacting with a, with a, with a social worker who suggested that, well, we should just put it in the water, like fluorine, yeah. fluoride, I mean, um, <laughs> because we all benefit from just a little bit of Ritalin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those are the kinds of things we talk amongst ourselves. But yeah, then. and we are recording the session, <laughs> yeah, though. Yeah, exactly. That's not, a, it is not an endorsement um, no. uh, coming from me, no. yeah. But you're right, I mean, and, and the possibility of pharmaceutical interventions for language impairments is, is absent. We haven't really explored that at all. But it, there's reasons to be cautious about that for all the, the reasons yeah. that, that's the main reason why we would talk about ADHD as a controversial diagnosis is because of the, of the treatment component that we're concerned about. I mean, that, that's why the public is skittish about um, ADHD is because of the, of the interventions that are used. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Judith Moskowitz. I'm actually a psychologist okay. from New York. Well, and, um, great. But I do a lot of differential diagnoses. Um, I was wondering about the age uh, in which the data is collected because sure. I do a lot of uh, differential diagnostic testing and what I always ask about is the kids who are the middle and high school level kids who have uh, that combination of attention deficit and 
language issues that uh, are manifested in the longer utterances, the more complex utterances, and then my question always becomes, what's working memory, what's language, and what's attention? Small question. Well, exactly. I, I, could, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, so to, to sort of clarify, maybe as I was speeding through my slides, I didn't point out that. So these are kids in the seven to nine year age range. And I deliberately selected that age range because that's the, the most common age of diagnosis of ADHD. And it's also, an, uh, when you take a look at the, the language development of kids with specific language impairment, it's also a period where they look like they're kind of catching up to their peers. Uh, people refer to it as illusory recovery. Uh, and then um, uh, as you move forward, they start to fall behind their peers again. And so that's, like a, that's, a, that's a window where diagnostic confusion could be, the, be heightened. Um, and uh, there's an interesting adjustment in the DSM where the, the age of onset was set at seven in DSM-4, and now it's been raised up to age 12, which, which does introduce the possibility that a child could start off as SLI and then sort of develop or mature into ADHD. I mean, that, that, that possibility is there. And um, it would be important to be able to have metrics that track both ADHD and language over a, a more extended age range. Um, I'm Karen Smith-Locke from Macquarie University in Australia. Um, I have a hot dog question. Okay. <laughs> um, because like a lot of people in the room, I'm intrigued with that finding um, of relatively better bad language. Um, have you had an opportunity to look at qualitative differences? For example, I'm trying to get out what causes somebody to make a mistake with sentence repetition. What kind of mistake it is? Is it a grammatical one? Is it a vocabulary one? Can you get attentional errors versus language errors? Yes. Um, well, no. <laughs> I haven't looked at those. Okay. But I agree with you that there's, there's multiple ways to be wrong. Mm. Um, and in the, in the project that I'm doing with Gerilyn Timler, we're, we're digging around in the narratives in a little more detail. And so she's looking at micro and macro structures of narratives to see, with the idea that, that, that ADHD would be more associated with the macro kinds of errors, um, uh, the organizational pieces, and that maybe the language impairment would be linked to the, um, uh, uh, the connections across sentences, the discourse markers there. Um, but that, that is, that's a rough slog to go through. Yeah. I'm not doing it, so. Um, <laughs> Thank I you. Report you just... about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but, but it, it, yeah, I agree. It, it, I wasn't expecting to see this as a subtractive phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it does link into that observation that, that so who, who ends up getting services? from speech language pathologists, what, what puts you in the front of the queue um, is a Y chromosome and an attitude problem, mm -hmm. um, apparently. And if, if we want to have caseloads that consist of individuals with Y chromosomes and attitude problems exclusively, then we're going about it the right way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perhaps before we go, we could um, ask you if you might let us know if uh, similar um, discrepancies in the types of kids that get services is true in Australia, or whether in Australia the kids uh, with language impairment without ADHD are being given services at a more equivalent level, and this would be anecdotal given that you didn't come prepared for a talk. Definitely anecdotal. I don't know of any data about that, um, but I would say that exactly the same thing happens. Um, Australia doesn't typically have speech pathology services in the schools, so um, you have to be very severe before you would be identified and lighting fires at the back of the classroom. That kind of thing is, is yeah, yeah. The, way, the way to get attention. So even in my clinical practice, I would see um, a number of children come forward first with the attentional diagnosis, um, and then eventually they might make their way to a speech, excuse me, speech pathologist. Yeah. Yeah, Off the top the, of my head. Uh, 
Wait, you, just, just curious. The, the report that I shared where there was a, a preferential um, accessing by kids with ADHD language impairment versus the kids with SLI was from an Australian epidemiological sample. Um, there's lots of really good epidemiological Australian samples out there. Um, and um, um, that does speak to this idea of that there's sort of a, a, a common, not necessarily a, a US specific dynamic in play here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have a few more minutes. Um, and I will ask another question unless somebody looks eager. Um, and this is a question that um, perhaps you will not feel like you can answer, and so I, I acknowledge that, but open it out there. And that is is that um, clearly one of the challenges with this population is it's sort of like, um, oh, what was the thing that was the silent killer? I can't remember. It was not cigarettes. It was something that was the silent killer. Heart attacks. Some kind of heart attack, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, this, this sounds good already. Yeah, so the question is, what we've got is a problem of these kids, um, you know, likely not drawing enough attention to themselves, likely not being enough of a problem in a classroom, not being disruptive enough, and basically not being seen with this disorder. It's sort of a silent disorder of sorts. What, what do you think, and this is kind of, kind of getting to an implementation science question, how can we change systems, how can we change culture, just have you any thoughts, and I encourage others then to, to, to come up as well, how we can change, um, you know, perhaps classroom teachers' uh, interest in this disorder, and even though the effects of this may not be today in this class right now, the long-term effects are clearly something that they would want to address, so please. Wow, okay. Yeah. Here's the world, here's my manifesto, right? Yeah. <laughs> the world according to me. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're at a very clear disadvantage by the fact that we have no mechanism for tracking how many kids with language impairment are out there. We can't, we can't articulate whether the, the prevalence is getting higher or lower or how it varies across regions. We can't rely on the Centers for Disease Control. And the, the Department of Education reports lump speech language of all different kinds together so that's essentially worthless information for this issue. Um, and so we need, we need to perhaps institute our own census um, of uh, what's going on uh, out in the clinical world. Um, the, the, uh, the, the irony of all this, of course, is that the reason why kids with specific language impairment don't get service is, be, is because they have a specific language impairment. Um, and um, when I interact with clinicians you, and you check in, I learned, I learned very quickly, you never approach clinicians and ask them, can, I, can you refer your kids with SLI to me? Uh, because they'll respond back and say, I don't have any kids with SLI on my caseload. Um, it's, not, it's, not the, um, uh, it's not how clinicians are parsing these, these things. Um, I basically ask now, uh, give me any kid who doesn't have an intellectual disability, and I'll sort them out um, on my end of things. Um, and so there's a, there's a clear disconnect between our research um, um, base and, uh, and how that's translating into the clinical enterprise. Well, a truer thing could never have been said because that is, in fact, uh, what has sparked the International Journal of Language and uh, Speech Communication to do that series, is that on the clinical side, um, we're not sure clinicians are using the term. We're not sure they necessarily have the testing and the wherewithal to implement that diagnosis accurately. And, and they will tell you they don't believe that SLI exists. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, a scary thought because um, and, and I think part of what's going on there is that in our, in our, in our research discussions, we, I think it's important to look at potential non-linguistic weaknesses in these kids. But if you, if, you, if you start to inventory these things, then it starts to look like that, that there really isn't a thing called SLI. Um, and if there's not a thing called SLI, then, 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 then I don't need to go looking for it. Um, and it, the, the consequence of that dynamic is what we see in front of us, where there's 80% of these kids um, not receiving services. Yeah. And given that challenge, I mean, we've got a chicken and egg problem. How are we going to get the census data to know how many kids are out there I know, because I nobody's know, I know. diagnosing them correctly? But, and, but I, 
I don't think the solution is for the research community to embrace the terminological confusion that's going on in the clinic, right? So if we try to, if we try to adjust ourselves to, to move around the terms that is, are being used in the clinical enterprise, uh, we have a choice of among, amongst a dozen different terms to go after. And uh, as Mabel pointed out in her introduction, uh, you cannot identify uh, causal mechanisms when you have these, these sort of like um, a convoluted discussions of, yeah, what is ADHD in a language disorder versus just a, langu just a language disorder yeah. um, uh, kinds of issues. SLI has a real uh, scientific value in, in, in allowing us to identify what are the necessary components of a language impairment.